personally, I believe that the real estate industry is pretty archaic, and to a large extent, it's uh, an industry of lemmings, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, because it's easier to differentiate yourself. Today, I'm fortunate to be sitting here with Doug Fry, an all-world commercial real estate legend. Doug's seen many real estate cycles from many different shoes, and today we'll be covering topics like brokerage, recessions, investing, and some forecasting about what the future holds for commercial real estate in the industry. In the early 80s, Doug started as a financial analyst before transitioning to brokerage after a decade at Grubb & Ellis in leasing and investment sales. He then cut his teeth on the principal side during a recession where he served as a vice president of acquisitions and dispositions for the Scheidler Group. With a renewed understanding of investment sales, Doug transitioned back to brokerage, leading the Capital Markets Group at Grubb & Ellis for seven years. And then in 2001, he became CEO of Colliers International, elevating it from 14th to third largest global commercial real estate firm. Post public offering in 2015, Doug retired to become a part-time investor and philanthropist, continuing to advise on real estate and investing strategies. Doug, thanks for joining me today. Really excited to have you here. And I think the big question I start with after hearing your background is what got you into real estate in the first place? Good question. Um, something my wife's asked me many, many times over the years, actually, <laughs> particularly the brokerage side. You know, I was fortunate. My parents owned a couple of rental properties. Mm. And when they uh, uh, had us working them, it was something that uh, was very satisfying. Uh, I love the cash flow. I love learning about it. So I knew I wanted to be in real estate, yeah. but uh, I didn't know exactly I didn't know exactly where. Yeah. Um, but uh, I ended up uh, as an analyst with a syndication firm outside of Chicago. And uh, part of my job responsibility was to go ahead and look at all the closing statements. And uh, I started to notice an interesting trend. Um, the accounts would be paid five or ten thousand dollars. The appraisers three, four, five. The attorneys were getting twenty, thirty thousand. And there was this line item, and it was. A hundred thousand dollars, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars. I thought that's what I want to do. I want to. <laughs> I think I want to be a broker. So uh, back in the day, I couldn't Google it. Uh, yeah. Cell phones weren't invented in nineteen eighty four, eighty five, something like that. And um, I pulled out the phone book and started calling brokerage companies. And off to the races. Yeah. I ended up at Grubb and Ellis in, down, in their downtown office. Wow. I mean, it's it feels a little bit like how I got started. I my parents owned some real estate. So I knew I wanted to be a part of it. And I was introduced to you within a year of getting my license at Collier's. Right. Didn't know commercial real estate was a big, big thing. Started seeing those line items and kind of exactly. ended up in the same, same place. When you were a broker, what do you feel really differentiated you from, from others? Probably my, my passion for specialization mm -hmm. and, and expertise. It's something that uh, I actually learned by accident early on. Uh, I was in that uh, first position down at, at Grubb and Ellis. I ended up doing a lot of discounted cash flows. Mm. And uh, I always, my, my wife calls me the boy of least resistance. Um, she, uh, she knows that I like to, to find the best way to get things done. So in this position, one of the things that I did was uh, I went out and I bought a IBM luggable computer. I don't even think you were born yet. 50 pounds. Uh, two floppy disks, and I started running discounted cash flows for everybody in the office. And it was interesting because as I did this, all of a sudden I had this credibility. Um, and I was young, and I looked young, younger than you look, actually. <laughs> um, it really gave me uh, the credibility I needed. Uh, soon everybody, all the leasing brokers were coming to me, and uh, I, I, I realized something, uh, something to be learned there, and I took it throughout my whole career. Everything I did, I had a passion for specialization. Interesting. So you're a broker in Chicago, you're specializing, you're starting to make a name for yourself, you're lugging this computer around and you buy your first investment. Why'd, why'd that come to be? Um, well, like I said, my parents uh, kind of planted the seed um, and I knew I wanted to buy. I knew I, I had to buy some real estate. Doing all those discounted cash flows, there's a saying that, uh, Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Um, I, I I debate that a little bit. I think amortization mm. is actually the eighth wonder of the world um, because over 20, 25 years, you just 
pay the asset off. Mm. And uh, I knew that from running the discounted cash flows that that's something that was gonna work for me. So I knew if I just acquired properties over time, eventually I'd be in the financial position I wanted to be in. Yeah. So, you know, I started looking for the opportunities and when I found an industrial building that made sense, I went out and had two credit cards, I borrowed a third one, had the seller take back financing, uh, and I was off to the races. It, it turned out great. Let's break down that deal a little bit. I know the size, you'd mentioned $400,000. Yeah. Uh, what year was that? Uh, well, what? I know exactly when it was because <laughs> what drove the deal was actually the 1986 Tax Reform Act. Okay. So there were a lot of sellers that wanted to sell their properties before that kicked in because there were some uh, adverse tax consequences as a result. So I had actually been talking to this guy and trying to sell it for him and he, he wouldn't move on his price, he wouldn't move on his price and uh, finally it was at the end of the year and uh, I said, well, I'll buy it. Yeah. If you have to sell it, I'll buy it, but this is my number. Yeah. And he sold it to me mm -hmm. and he took back seller financing. There you go. So you, you have this first deal, you're, did you lease it? Did it need any? It had a tenant. Had a tenant? It had a tenant. It was single tenant. Okay. Um, and my wife, I'll never forget, she, I told her that we did this and she was on board with it. Uh, and I came home one night and we were having dinner and she goes, well, that all makes sense, but what happened if the tenant leaves? <laughs> and I said, well, that would be a problem. For yeah, that would be a problem. That's a good transition to you, you own this property now, you're still a broker. Do you think it started to inform what you're doing in brokerage a bit oh, more? Without a doubt, it changed, it, it changed the way I thought about the whole business. Hmm. Uh, and specifically stuff like environmental reports mm. and well, everything across the board, the whole due diligence process. It's one thing when you're a broker yeah. and you're trying to get a transaction closed and you're trying to help your client. You're like, well, I know the environmental is an issue, but it's not that bad. Let's just close the deal. Yeah. Now, as a principal, you're sitting there and you're looking at the environmental and, and they're saying, well, it's not that bad, but if it hits the groundwater, then you're liable for everything. You're yeah. thinking, so what happens? Well, you pretty much lose everything. It just changes, it changes the way you look at the world. And uh, I think my clients benefited from it because I became quite the advocate for their interests yeah. as if I was buying the property. Yeah, I remember first property I bought, uh, commercial property actually you, you helped me acquire. I remember sitting down, which I'd be thinking of, and I remember you saying, get an environmental report. Right. And so I call these different folks in Spokane, I need an environmental report, and they said, based on the size of that deal, Right, you, you don't need one. No lender requires it, no one does that. And I went back to you and said, well, here's what the people that don't own property said. And you're like, well, if it goes completely upside down, can you pay me back 900 grand? Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, great, let's get an environmental report. So I remember learning from that. Yeah, as a lender, you get pretty interested in environmentals as well. I bet. So speaking of um, real estate investing, What's something that, that you believe that might be maybe against the grain when it comes to investing in real estate? When you say against the grain, from a principal standpoint? Or? Um, I guess a less popular belief, you know, like there's axioms like location, 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 and other things that people say, but I, I don't know if all the advice is, is really credible. Yeah, well, there's, there's quite a few out there. I mean, I, personally, I believe that the real estate industry is pretty archaic and to a large extent, it's uh, an industry of lemmings, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, because it's easier to differentiate yourself. Yeah. So what do you mean by archaic? Uh, historically, real estate just has not been willing to adopt technology mm. uh, at a pace that most businesses do. Yeah. Uh, when you look at how long it took CoStar and uh, LoopNet to, to come into the market and do what they've done. Yeah. And if you look specifically at the apartment side of the business right now, there's there's no multiple listing guide. If I wanted to know what was available in any given market yeah. around the country, yeah. it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And then you compare that to residential, right? If there's a house on your street that's for sale, you can go find out quite a bit of information on Redfin, Zillow, you name the, the app, right? Absolutely. Commercial, if I said, go find me some apartment buildings to buy, you couldn't find any. Exactly. And, and what I think that prevents is, is really new market entrance. There's people, investors out there that would love to own some of these buildings that have to do fundraise or crowd strike or whatever it is to get invested because it's impossible to go find new investments. So I think we miss out on this huge group of people that are producing 
uh, enormous wealth that would love to invest that we can't sell buildings to because there's this breakdown of communication between what we have to sell and what they have to, to buy. I, I couldn't agree more, but I have to ask you. Yeah. I can't say it, but I, I'm going to ask you. Yeah. Why is that? How deep do you want me to go? I'll, it's your podcast. It's the, it's, I, I think it's the walled garden that I walked into that I didn't know existed. Right. I had no idea that these commercial properties were available, who owned them, how to penetrate it. And I think what the commercial real estate industry has done a great job of is keeping this walled garden up. It's not transparent and no one else can enter. So we won't get into the, the long term historical or forward looking impacts of that. But that's why a few people have kept it to themselves. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the concept of uh, holding every asset till the end is a bad concept a lot of people believe that once you buy it you just put it away mm. um, so I, I would say you know that's probably one of the, the the things that I just wouldn't agree with yeah that's fair I, I forgot to ask this but circling back quickly did that tenant ever leave that first investment property and actually the, the tenant did leave um, <laughs> how, how long after you bought it? It, it it was a while I, we got a couple of years out of him but he did leave so I, I Again, I got to learn everything you wanted to learn yeah. about owning a property, <laughs> uh, marketing it, selling it to a user, hiring brokers. Yeah. It was the first time I hired a broker uh, because uh, it was an industrial property and I was specializing in uh, apartments. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was it was quite the educational process. It worked out great. Yeah. Uh, ended up making uh, a reasonable return on it. Did a 1031 into the, our next property, uh, which was apartments, and then it. 1031 out of that and, and we just kept building it so there, there's so many ways to make money in real estate if yeah. you're smart enough to spend a little time learning sticking with that you don't have to hold it till the end which i have heard and, and, and do agree with uh how did you know when to sell well in this particular case it was easy because uh i couldn't carry the property mm. uh, we just didn't have the the resources um <clears throat> at the at the end of the day i don't think that uh every asset is meant to be kept long term. Mm -hmm. And this was this was a starter asset for me. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I had to sell it, but I probably would have sold it anyways, as, as I called through my portfolio and yeah. uh, looked at what the uh, other options would be. I, I, I probably would have got out of it either way. Yeah, it kind of loops back. It does loop back to that property I bought. You helped me buy the first one. I was on the phone with a mentor and said, you know, I hear never sell, never sell, never sell. You just sold your whole portfolio. And he said, well, is there a certain property that always comes to mind when you're in the shower that you just think about and not in a good way? Yeah. yeah it's that first one I bought. And he's like, then get rid of it. <laughs> and we got rid of it and we exchanged it and it, it ended up being really good. But there's, yeah. that, there's that mental aspect that has nothing to do with the discounted cash flow. You just kind of know in your heart of hearts when it's time to move on from a property. Without a doubt. And I promise you, you're going to have assets you wish you had sold sooner. You're going to have assets <laughs> you wish you still owned. The key is just not to think about it and just keep moving. Yeah. Just go, go after the next one. So moving through, so your broker, you're doing some investing, and then you decide to leave brokerage and go full-time vice president, Shadler Group. You're there for a couple of years. Right. What did you learn? Uh, more of the same, actually. Uh, the mindset of a principal. Mm. Um, you know, some of the technical aspects of underwriting, uh, you know, the valuation process from uh, a principal standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, it, it hammered home uh, a different way of looking at the assets than just a transactional side that a broker mm. tended to look at. And it actually formed my thinking on how to go back and, and run a, a division of, of the brokerage company and uh, eventually to run a company. Mm. Uh, what, what's important? to the client at the end of the day. Yeah. Because the whole secret to running a brokerage company is understanding what the client needs. Yeah, that's a good point. Sticking there for a little bit, uh, what, why did you decide or when did you decide it was time to bring those skills you'd learned back to brokerage? I have a, a good friend who was a CEO at Grubbin Ellis at the time, and he looked at me one day when I was complaining about everything not being done the way it should be done. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know what, maybe you should, maybe you should do it. So he, he promoted me up uh, always. And um, eventually I just got to the point where I thought, I, 
I think I have a better way to do this. Mm. I, I really think I love the the transactional side of the business. Yeah. I love the, the the deal, but I just had this desire um, after looking at a couple of platforms and saying, "Gosh, there's, there's a better way to do this." Mm. At the time, Grub and Ellis was well. I think Grub and Ellis still is, is really a, a national, not an international company, mm-hmm. and uh, I really wanted it to be international. Yeah. And I couldn't I couldn't win that argument. Yeah. Uh, so when the opportunity presented itself at Collier's, I thought. You know what? If I had my own company, I'd be in a better position to affect the change that I thought needed to take place. Yeah. You were there for a while operating in the is it capital markets for Grub and Ellis? What was your, explain that uh, role a little bit. Capital markets, it was uh, the investment division. So it included appraisal and consulting, uh, private capital, institutional okay. capital, and um, mortgage uh, capital markets finance and were brokers reporting to you were you helping them like what was a little bit of both Uh, we had brokers uh, direct reports as well as uh, oversight responsibility uh, for the national investment group gotcha and they grub and Ellis was transitioning at the time they were trying to get into the institutional side of the business so that was a heavy lift yeah so you move from this role in capital markets to Collier's, was that transition, did it happen naturally? Were you looking for it? Yeah, I, I wasn't really looking for it. Okay. Um, I, I, Grub and Ellis was in this process of being sold, and so I knew um, in all likelihood that I was gonna actually take off and go sailing. Um, that was the plan. Yeah. Um, my wife and I just, just, we had two boys, and, and we thought, we'll take the money and we'll go sailing for a couple of years, and uh, didn't sell, Grub and Ellis didn't sell, um, so a recruiter, a recruiter called me and said, you know, what do you think about this opportunity? So we changed all of our plans. Yeah. This is often the case with yeah. life, right? And we decided to move from Chicago to Seattle, take the opportunity. Um, I looked at Collier's and at the time it was a network and I thought there's some great things that can happen here. Yeah. And so Chicago being historically one of the big financial cities in this country's history and now coming to Seattle, what things about Seattle were attractive? What opportunities do you think remained? We love Chicago. We loved raising our kids there. We love the city. Um, it's a great city. Uh, didn't like the traffic. Didn't like the weather. Um, Seattle, on the other hand, is, is uh, just a, a fabulous city. The quality of life here is, is phenomenal. Um, the depth of the intellectual capital here yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. You've got technology. Um, it's a technology hub. So everything about Seattle is, is, is pretty positive. It's been a great move for us. And I think that Seattle's positioned really well moving forward. Mm. It's truly an international city, even though it's small. Yeah. Um, smaller. I shouldn't say small. I'll offend somebody. But um, yeah, I, I think Seattle's in a, in a great position. So Doug, you think Seattle's positioned well, and I'm hoping that means real estate. Yes, for real estate, but ultimately Seattle's positioned well because it's a great place to live. People Mm -hmm. want to be here, which is obviously really good for real estate. Yeah. Uh, Before we transition to maybe some challenges here, what's a success story you have from your college days? Success stories. Well, we have we had a lot of fun and uh, there were a lot of good things that happened. Um, I got I got one I can tell real quick. Okay. it was uh, I started working at Collier's international headquarters on the 48th floor of two union brokerages on 53 and we got invited down for for fridays you remember that vaguely <laughs> and they went around to all the restaurants in seattle and bought sides of fries and so we could sample i think i tried like 10 different fries but named after your last name fridays yeah. and we could all hang out with the ceo i thought that was pretty cool no, <laughs> uh, actually, you want to know a success story? I'll tell you a, a fun success story. About the same time, 2010, um, some uh, a family friend called and said, "Hey, I've got a friend who's looking for a job," and uh, I said, "Great, I'll talk to him." And uh, he came in and he looked younger than I was when I interviewed for my first job, <laughs> and uh, said he was in residential real estate, and um, he seemed to have good energy. And I thought, you know what? He has no experience at all. He's green as they come. But I think, I think we're going to take a chance on him. So I talked to the local guy, local manager, and he hired him. And uh, you turned out to be a pretty good find. <laughs> you really did. And I'm, I'm not just blowing smoke. I will tell you, Jared, for me, you validated many of the things I believed in. Mm. Many of the things about how to run a business, how to set people up, the expertise portion, 
um, the ethics. Those are all things that are really important to me. And you embraced them, and you are you've done a phenomenal job. In fact, I, let me ask you: when when you look at that, yeah, that. Um, that process, people always ask me, what, what would you do differently or how would you do this? You've been around long enough. You, yeah. you started with zero and yeah. had a meteoric rise. What would you tell somebody who's stumbling into the CEO's office at 23 or 24? First, do your research and know who you're talking to. I had no idea you were the CEO. I figured I was talking to some floor manager or some, I just showed up and I saw the size of the office. and I was like, oh shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready for this. Uh, but you were really easy going. I think it was, hey, let's get out of this office, grab a coffee. After that, and having the experience of going and interviewing different brokerage firms, what I really liked about the person I was introduced to by, by you guys was, was Dylan, was technology, which right. is something you mentioned. He was really interested in technology. Um, the thing I'd do differently, if I could do it all over, I spent two whole years just, we call it the spaghetti model of brokerage, just throwing it against the wall and seeing if anything would stick. Right. And it wasn't until my fifth or sixth year when I said, hey, we got a good database, but it's not great. And we spent probably six months of like real brokerage time missing out on opportunities to sell deals to go build what I think is the best database in this whole region. And that's of investors. So going and querying every sale that happened up and down the coast, every single active buyer, every single owner. And, and now when I pick up the phone, I'm certain I'm going to reach the right person and be able to get the, the listings and things we sell out to all the right people. So if I could do it over, it would have been focused on the database first, but I just, I was clamoring for a deal that was just kind of burn through all these contacts. Okay, no sellers, burn through these ones, no sellers, and take zero notes and improve nothing for the long term. Right. Uh, but once I got my feet under me, had closed a few deals that made it easier to, to pick my head up and say, we need to change how we do this because it's pretty sloppy. Yeah, the expertise piece you nailed mm -hmm. um, it, with the database and the information you acquired, being really knowledgeable, the smartest people in the market, in your specific market, I think is really what separated you from, from the pact and it, still makes me smile because as, as we talked about earlier, it's something I preached. Yeah. In fact, when people come to me, young kids come and they say, you know, what do I need to do? I said, be an expert at something. I don't yeah. care if it's the best, best kid at the coffee maker, yeah. you know, you gotta be known for something. Yeah. And as, as you get better and better at it, your, your scope actually narrows and, and narrows and narrows. And then at some point you're, you're so good at it that people then come from different markets and different areas to take advantage of your expertise. So it's, I really think it's the way to build credibility and it's the quickest way to be successful is to specialize. Yeah, that came up, I had a meeting before this shoot today and it came up, hey, and if you ever have any self storage or you have it, I said, I just don't do it. It's apartments, it's Seattle, that's all I do. And he's like, I should have done that 40 years ago. Right? Yeah. He's a broker, I should have done that 40 years ago. So well, you said, uh, you said that you, uh, didn't do your research uh, when you came in in that first interview. And that's so common and that's such a big mistake. I know. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I really believe that you need to, you need to know what you're walking into and you need to pay attention to what's going on. I, I will tell you a funny story. Um, when I took the job at Collier's, I looked young. I was 40, but I looked less than 40. I saw the, the photo. <laughs> yeah, no, I still, uh, you know, I, I used to get teased uh, as a cross between Michael J. Fox and Doogie Howser. And, <laughs> I didn't take that as a compliment, go figure. Uh, but um, I showed up in Vancouver, which is where my uh, predecessor and the headquarters for Collier's was. BC? Yeah, uh, British Columbia in Canada. And I, I walked in and I had this little black carry case that I had, travel uh, carry on. And I walked into the receptionist's office and I said, hi, um, I'm here. Um, a little bit late, I apologize, flight was late. No problem, sit down. Comes back a couple minutes later and they take me back to the copy machine. And I'm looking at her and she says, I don't know if it's the toner or what, but, and I looked at her and I said, um, I'll take a look at it, <laughs> but I'm not really that good with copiers. I'm actually here to see John McLaren and I'm the new CEO. Yeah. <laughs> and she just looked at me and her mouth dropped. And I felt bad for her because I, I probably could have diffused it a little earlier, but I was I was curious. I thought, wow, this is this is really happening. Yeah, I'm, I'm showing up, and she doesn't she doesn't have a clue. Yeah, but there Humbling. you go. Yeah, it, it was fine. It worked out perfectly. So we've gotten through a little bit of your timeline, career timeline. 
you've seen four going on what five recessions in different hats almost each time. Yep. What was what was the hardest one for you personally, and and why? Well, actually, believe it or not, it was not 2007 and 2009, which is everybody's answer. Yeah. Because it, the magnitude of that recession it was the, the longest, um, and it was, it was just severe. The, the thing that was unique about that is we had never been down many of those roads, mm. and there were some decisions made that had never needed to be made before. And sure. in hindsight, I, I give a lot of people a lot of credit. Mm. They made a lot of good decisions. Yeah. Uh, my humble opinion. But the one that impacted me the worst was actually in 1991. Mm. Um, you weren't born yet, were you? Yeah, I was. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I might have been out of diapers. <laughs> <laughs> it was close. Well, I'm glad you didn't have to live through it. Uh, no, it was, it, was, it was bad. And what was unique about it is there's no capital in the system, mm. right? It was the FS, LIC uh, debacle, savings and loan savings debacle. Savings and loan, yeah. There was just no money. So as a broker at the time, there's nothing you can do if, if people can't get financing. So cash was king. Uh, there were cash buyers, very, very few. Um, and they were picking up assets at 50, 40 and 50 cents on the dollar. Mm. And uh, there was there was really nothing we could do other than a lot of auctions. Mm. We did auctions, but it, you didn't make any money in auctions. Auctions just to get someone to show up? Yeah. Yeah. We we partnered with a large auction firm and, and did these massive auctions. I mean, it's funny, I sold, um, not personally, but with the team I was on and with the auction company, we sold a billion dollars of real estate that year. Wow. And it was my lowest earning year yeah. ever. So that gives you an idea how lucrative that process is. Yeah, yeah. There was it was it was a very very tough market. In fact, I remember in downtown Chicago, and this was true of many CBDs, they were actually executing leases at negative rents. Yeah, yeah that's a lot of people look at me when I say that. Go, yeah. What do you mean negative yeah. rents? That makes no sense. I'm looking at our office market right now. I'm like, well, if you've got ten or twelve dollars of operating expenses, yeah, uh, and you ask someone just to pick up half of the operating expenses. Um, that's a negative rent, right? Mm. It's, it's net. So were you representing the, the owner of the building or was it the, the lender on the building? Like if you're selling 50% off, who, who's got control? At, at that time I was an investment professional uh, and I was actually representing buyers or sellers, okay. um, not the tenants. Gotcha. So we didn't like seeing those deals. Yeah. That, that, was, that was bad for IRR. Yeah, so being on both sides of the deal sounds like a tough situation not too far from maybe where we're at today. I know we haven't had the, the meltdown on interest rates or what you guys had de dealt with then, but tough to get a sale done with interest rates where they are and for office in particular, occupancy where it is. What's the advice for an owner when they're staring down and they thought they might make a little money and then they thought they may make break even and lose a little and now maybe a lot. But, yeah. You know, and then they all, I have clients in all those those stratospheres right now. What do you do when? That's tough. It's easy to say what to do. It's yeah. just it's but, tough. It's tougher when you're in that position. Yeah. And fortunately, as a property owner, it at least gives me the perspective and the empathy. Yeah. Um, but this is where I take something from. Uh, I, I love taking things from different markets, yeah. different industries, okay. and taking ideas from smarter people and then trying to apply them to what I'm doing. Yeah. This reminds me, this question reminds me of is um, Peter Lynch uh, was the lead um, fund manager for Magellan. And one of his concepts that he taught me, uh, gosh, very, very early on, is uh, the difference between uh, successful traders and losers. And successful traders, they have a expectation for their stock. If it doesn't meet it, they sell it. They go buy another one because it takes too long for the stock to recover or it doesn't recover. Mm. And what happens is by doing that, they end up with a portfolio of, of winners because yeah. they keep shedding the losers. Yeah. Contrast that with the amateur. Yeah. The amateur goes out and he buys a stock and it doesn't perform and he holds on to it and says, ah, we'll see what happens. And then he has a stock that does pretty well and he says, well, I think I'll take a little profit. So he takes profit. So over time, what happens is your amateur investor ends up with a portfolio, literally, of losers because he won't sell. Yeah, I saw this as a broker yeah. and then as a principal, and I thought, you can apply this to real estate. If you don't have an asset that you have a lot of confidence in, yeah, you need you need to sell it. You need to move on. And uh, there's a chart that I used to use. Um, 
gosh, I'd be fun to see if I could even find it. And it just shows the market going down. And it shows basically what you have to do as an, an investor, as a seller. If a market's going down, you can't go across and meet the market. Yeah. Because by the time you get it under contract and you go through the marketing process and get it under contract, yeah. every, the market has slid again. Yeah, you find out inflation didn't go down. It went up, just like we did. And rates go the wrong and way. So the guys the uh, on the buy side go, you know what? We're going to blow out of this one. Yep. So you actually have to drop down a little bit and go across mm. to catch the market. And it's a really tough concept, especially when your asset was worth 10, 20, 30% more 18 or 24 months ago. Yeah. But we don't make the rules. We just have to play by them. This brings up a lot of good, I think, good questions for me. Um, making it bring it to the personal side, you've probably been in an investment where you had to do that. And I, I know we've invested together, and you're right. like, you're like, hey, this is all fun and games while we're making money. It, it'll be interesting to see what it's like when we're not making money. Right. right. Any any stories from from a deal yeah. that went sideways? And I'm in a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a couple, and sideways is a hard word, but. Um, we've had a conversation about assets we've looked at mm -hmm. and um, we've got uh, some assets we purchased and a lot of people are in this position right now where they bought an asset, it had a little cash flow or they were going to rehab it and going to have more cash flow and then we we're going to refinance. Mm. And a lot of folks made the wrong assumption about what that cost of financing was going to be. And how quickly it would change. It, it changed rapidly. I yeah. mean, I don't know the the historic numbers exactly, but I, I venture to say that we've never seen uh, rates go up as quickly as they did in a 12 month period. Yeah. Um, and it, it caught a lot of people, even people. I mean, we were having the conversation mm -hmm. aware of what could happen and made yeah. the decision in one case to say, oh, I think we'll be OK. <laughs> we'll be fine. Um, yeah, it's interesting when I think about that, because uh, a couple investments we ended up doing and ones we didn't, it felt better to just take a smaller risk. You right. know? Let's just take a small one. That way if we're wrong, it doesn't hurt so bad. It's like, if we're feeling that way, maybe you don't take that risk at all. Exactly. Is, is what I'm telling myself now that I'm learning. And yeah. back to your amateur investing story, I have one from the pandemic. You and many people were making money hand over fist in the stock market after it had taken a, a plummet. And I had some friends, not investors whatsoever, sitting at home, working from home, and investing, right? right. Buying stocks. Very common. And, and uh, I said, give me some tips, right? So I took some money and threw it in these stocks I had no, no information about, didn't know anything about the companies, set no limits, no sells on them, and just sat them there and saw them grow rapidly. And I'm like, well, this is great, right, right? right? And then it got busy in real estate. I'm not kidding, it wasn't, it wasn't laziness, I forgot. And I went back to look at that portfolio six months later and those things were upside down and sideways. And I was like, oh God, you know, I had to tell my wife, here's yeah. what I did, here's what happened. And same thing, I called someone very wise and said, what would you do? Sell them all, put them back in the S&P, <laughs> learn your lesson. It's, so, I, it's absolutely the way to go. Yeah. Um, I wish I'd have sold sportsathome.com when I had the chance. But. Sports at home? There's a reason you don't recognize it. <laughs> Is it like Peloton? Uh, it's worse. <laughs> it's worse. It's worse. But Shifting a little bit to the market we're in, you, you think uh, there could be a, a storm coming or it's a brewing. You want to break that down for us a, a little bit? Well, I'm... In general, I'm an optimistic person. Yeah. Uh, I really am. And I, I, even when things aren't great, I try and look at uh, you know, the bright side and, and find something positive to focus on. Um, and there are lots of good things to focus on right now, so don't get me wrong. But there, there's some tough things going on out there right now. Yeah. Uh, when you look at uh, the geopolitical landscape uh, and what's going on, there's there's plenty of things that can catch us. And, and nowadays, different than historically, some people would say, yeah, it's always been that way, but because of technology and social media, we we just hear it all the time. Yeah. And, but it's always been this way. Uh, not true. I mean, we've always had problems, yes, but we've never had a global economy that was connected the way it is. Mm. We've never had technology accelerate good things and bad things like it does. We've never been uh, so connected. Even, even the concept, you know, there's, experts out there say, oh, we got to decouple economies to, to mitigate our risk. Even the, the process of decoupling is very dangerous mm -hmm. and, and could uh, cause some, some significant uh, economic uh, impact. But yeah, I, I, 
I don't want to be negative, but at, at the same time, there's so many things out there that can bother us. We need to be really smart about what we do. Shoot us, shoot us straight. What do you think the three biggest maybe risk factors, not just real estate, but they're kind of looming right now in the market? Well, I'll, I'll start globally and then we can talk yeah. about more micro things. I mean, globally, I think climate change is, and I'm sorry, there's probably folks out there who think it's just a cycle and this is what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, it's, it's not just a cycle. Uh, we've had cycles since the planet Earth, but if you look at from the time man arrived, that is not a cycle. We've never had a cycle like this. Mm. Uh, so if you haven't figured out yet, I'm in the camp that we should be paying closer attention. Yeah. Um, so you have to lay that over over everything. So I think climate change is, is the most important. Yeah. All the other things, frankly, it, as important as they are, yeah. uh, if we don't get climate change right, then we're just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> Um, but uh, there are some big things going on. I, the uh, the polarization of society is a is a big yeah. issue right now. Yeah. Um, uh, cyber attacks, cyber um, the technology and, and the way it can be manipulated is, is a is a is a major uh, issue. I think bringing it here locally, uh, it's interesting that in the past things that happened in other countries, yeah, they could impact us long term and in various ways. But now, you know, if, if China increases its military presence in the in the South China Sea, uh, or Russia invades the Ukraine, or uh, our friend in North Korea does what he does, or we have a cyber attack anywhere in the world, yeah. it can literally, in days, weeks, months, impact the value of your apartment building in Seattle. Mm. And that's that to me is, when we talk about this, that to me is the difference. Mm. Um, it doesn't mean you curl up in a ball. It doesn't mean you stop investing in real estate or stocks or you go buy gold or any of that. Yeah. It just means that when you're investing in real estate, anticipate what it might look like if one of those things happens. Do you think real estate having, you know, being tangible as it is, and I'd say a necessity if you're talking apartments, do you think it's a little more insulated than your next hot stock tip? or tech company or is it still subject to the same same swings no i think i think depending on everything's relative right yeah. i think depending on the real estate you buy yes mm. uh, you're buying the right location and the right product type and putting the right amount of debt on it uh yes i think you can mitigate many of the risks yeah. and and long term be very very comfortable um but there's a flip side ask some of the people you know who are heavy in office right now how they're feeling about owning a hard asset. Office was a no-brainer in 2019. I mean, when we were there, we were at Collier's and there's there's teams at Collier's, at least the one we're at. There's an industrial team, there's multifamily team ourselves, and then there's an office team. And it's like, we had our day, it was like 2014 through 17. We were, you know, maybe top of that list. And then right. the office, I mean, they're just, they're well ahead of everyone else. No one was even close in commissions. And that was just the, the thing to do. And they said, you know, we used to historically underwrite 10% vacancy in office, so we're bumping it down to five. Right. This is, this is just premier grade A stuff. And 2020 hits. And now an industrial just went bananas, right? With distribution and everything. So it'll be interesting to see what happens next. Like, is, is, is retail gonna have its day? I don't know. Well, what do you think about office? Because that's a fun debate. And, um, I've got a lot of friends who own office and they they tell me, oh, it's coming back. Yeah. You know, people are going back to work and it's it's not a problem. Uh, I'm in another camp with yeah. all due respect. Yeah. Uh, I think we're coming to the end of the uh, extend and pretend phase. Uh, I think. <laughs> I think it's we've kind of pretended long enough, and you're talking you know, about loans, loans, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, the loans or, or that, leasing, uh, exactly, yeah. Um, so I think that uh, I think there's a, a bigger problem. Mm. Uh, yes, some of these companies have mandated people come back to work, but what is the main argument? What I mean, you tell me. I hear that the the argument for uh, offices, yeah. well, they they need to network and they need to um, uh, work together, right? Yeah. My, my team experienced that. I mean, pandemic hits in March of 2020. We're home pretty immediately. I think it was like March 14th or 15th. And we had a team of myself and my partner, Dylan, right? We'd been together for seven, eight years. So we felt this is weird, but we're, we're okay. We know what to do. We had some staff, they were uncomfortable. We had some, but, but it was the brokers. It was like the four or five younger brokers that were like, I have no idea what I'm doing. 
You know, right. I'm freaked out. I'm at home. I don't know what to do. I can't go see properties. I can't hear Jared and Dylan on the phone. And so it, the, we got an email or a text from one of our, our brokers. It's like, it, as soon as we came back in the office, I'd like to. And right. so I asked everyone else and everyone said the same. So we asked Kidder when we could go back to the office. They said this time and we've been back ever since. Now what changed for me is I like working on projects without being distracted. So I take one day a week and work from home on projects kick administrative things and things I just need to focus on to one day a week, but we're back in the office. So that's been our, our story. Real estate is a local thing. Um, I personally believe that, that a majority of people go back to the office. I think there might be some flexibility, mm -hmm. but I've seen even within our own office trying the, they call them like the, the condominium office or something like that, where oh, it's so-and-so's desk two days a week and that the person, no one likes that. Right. And it's either my desk or it's not. So, and then the, the argument on space, oh, because of the pandemic, it will be spaced out again more. I don't, I don't know if I've, I'm going for that one. I mean, back to the Axiom location, location, location. Just spoke with a big office brokerage team uh, earlier this week. And they said the, the really great buildings and great spaces are actually fine. It's this kind of B product that was either built poorly or didn't keep up with the market. You couldn't put enough TIs and tenant improvements into it to attract anyone. Right. Um, so I'll I'll what's your I'll bring all of my friends that own office to you and you can buy it at a slight discount because you're a bigger believer in office than I am. <laughs> I hear collaboration is the big thing. Yeah. Uh, they you need to get them together to collaborate. Yeah. And I I I'm not buying that argument because I have spent lots of time with people under 30 and they do not need to be in an office to collaborate. In okay. fact, I've sat you've had this experience. I've mm -hmm. been sat at a bar of a six top and there's four, five, six people sitting there, all under 30, and we're collaborating. Mm -hmm. Only thing is, we're collaborating, looking at our phones, yeah. and and literally, this person can be talking to the person across. The yeah. I should say this personally. I agree that I would prefer to collaborate in an office yeah. with people. That's yeah. how I was raised. Yeah. And that may be how you were raised to a large degree. Yeah. These next generation, it's not how they're raised, and it's, technology is pushing them to their phones and pushing them to rely on different ways of communicating. So mm. I think long term, I'm, I'm a little bearish on it. Yeah, it's a personal bias of mine. I think back to um, like hiring virtual assistants or I've hired people in other markets to manage our properties. And it's not till I get boots on the ground and meet them and shake their hand, and talk about what our plan is, where I feel like we're actually affecting change. So maybe that's just me, but that's where I feel really put in the face to face interaction is really important. Now you don't have to be in an office to do that. Um, but yeah, I could definitely have some personal bias there. I hope you're right. We'll I, see. I really hope you're right. Um, and uh, I what's the opposite? I mean, I, I'm, I can think of the extreme opposite argument that we never go back to work. What do you think that is the realistic new norm? Oh, I, th I think, you know, 30% um, is probably a good number uh, for if working I had to, from home or 30% uh, of the people will will not return. Okay, so 70% are back but 30 are not something like that or even looking at it as a usage standpoint, somewhere in the 60 to 70% of office space will be needed. Mm. So whether I whether or not an individual will come and go, I think it'll be more. They'll come and go less. Yeah. Uh, so your friends, I don't own any office space, mm -hmm. your friends with office. Let's let's imagine there's a world where it's thirty percent vacant forever. Right. What do they do with the space? Do they, do you get the rates low enough where people just spread out, or what, what happens? That's a great question. I mean, <laughs> and if you come up with the answer, you can make a lot of money yeah. really fast. And it, it's not converting to apartments. Like it's not converting. No, to apartments. from what I understand, and and I'm not an engineer, but from what I understand, um, <clears throat> with the the windows, the configuration of the HVAC and uh, the way these office builders are built, it's just too, it's not cost effective yeah. to convert them into apartments. Yeah. So um, if if that were the case, it would be done yeah. already. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's going to, I think there's a big shift that's mm. going to take place. Um, and like anything, we'll figure it out. Yeah. It's just, it's going to cost somebody some money and somebody else is probably going to make a lot of money. Yeah. So that's, that's why we need people like you to help us figure it out. We're trying. Um, Last question, what are you doing with your investment dollars today? Well, as I said earlier, I think that we always have to 
invest and and look at potential recessions mm -hmm. given the landscape that we live in these days. So I'm uh, last year I sold a couple of things. This year I'm going to sell a couple of more that I just think aren't going to perform. Taking my own advice. Yeah, um, it's just I'm, kind of it's a loser. I don't like get it. Get rid of the losers. No. Take my medicine. Um, <clears throat> and they're not even losers. They're just not performers. Yeah, uh, they don't. Ha you don't have to be losing money. These, yeah. these are just. Warren Buffett said, "Don't don't buy anything you don't want to own for ten years." Mm. Now he's talking about stocks, but again, I love taking that stuff and applying. And the concept is valid. Yeah, if you don't have confidence in an asset over a ten year horizon, um, just take your medicine. Okay. And what is for you? It sounds like you've done it before. What does taking your medicine look like? Because I think myself, <clears throat> there's so much ego tied up in, I'd say, losing money. But then as someone told me, if you're just not at the plate, you can never hit a home run either. You can't even get a single. So you've right. got to swing. Like, is there any sort of two thirds will do well, one, one third won't? Or like, could I get so tied up and yeah. I made a huge mistake, I'm an idiot. You know, I think that's where people stop from going and taking the next step to invest. I think we have to be willing to take calculated risk. Yeah, I may not be the right person to ask yeah. um, because uh, I feel really comfortable making mistakes. I've made lots of mistakes. So it, to me, it, Admitting a mistake is liberating uh, in a lot of ways. You yeah. know, you, you, that that asset that's not performing, you have to look at it every day and suffer. Yeah. Uh, once you say, "Well, I picked this one uh, wrong. I didn't didn't pick the right uh, right building or uh, sector," so I'm just going to move on. Mm. Um, but I, I really think that uh, at at the end of the day, you have to you have to be honest with yourself. Uh, and take your medicine. Yeah. That's that's it in a nutshell. I like what you said about the suffering. If you're just suffering, just move on. Yeah. Yeah. And again, as an optimist, there's always a better deal out there. Yeah. <laughs> so don't focus on the fact that you did poorly. Focus on the fact that you can take that capital and redeploy it in a way that you're more likely to make a lot more money. Yeah. And and there are gonna be there are going to be some great opportunities in the next one, two, three, four years. Uh, I don't I don't doubt that for a second. Well, Doug, thanks for coming out today. So great to learn all of your, learn from your knowledge, from analyst to broker to investor to CEO. Uh, I think I really enjoyed hearing about mostly what to do when things don't go well. Uh, so. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Still learning. <laughs> so learning from that. Thanks for joining us today. We'd love to hear from you specifically. What do you think? Are we going back to the workforce in person or working from home? If you want to learn more about our listings, please check out our website. You can always get in touch with me to learn what's going on in the commercial real estate industry. And always, please feel free to subscribe and follow us. Mm -hmm.